Okay, hopefully everybody can see the presentation all right. If there are any problems, of course, just feel free to let me know. Um, so hello again. Uh, thank you for having me, first of all. This is my third presentation uh, with AIU, so it's good to be back. Um, a little very brief background about myself. Uh, my own background is in chemistry. I did my undergraduate and graduate degrees in chemistry. Uh, and after finishing up my education, I went ahead into consulting for a while, working in specialty chemicals and materials. Um, after doing that for a while, I ended up moving on and working for myself. And now I'm involved in a number of different projects that are all fundamentally science and technology focused. And I've had uh, plenty of research experience in materials chemistry, uh, sustainability, sustainability-based chemistry, and so on. So that's sort of the perspective I'm coming from. Um, and hopefully that gives me some degree of credibility. Uh, I've given two talks prior to this. They were also both chemistry focused, science and technology focused. Um, and I noticed in the question and answer sections and so on um, that most of the questions were about sustainability and climate and environmental science. So I figured for today's talk, it might be most interesting and most useful to do a bit of a sweeping overview of the energy market and specifically renewable energy versus non-renewable energy and, specific, and even more specifically focusing in on renewable energy. So therefore the, the title of today's talk is Renewable, en renewable Energy, A Complete Picture. Um, and just to sort of set expectations, um, this is sort of a broad sweeping overview of everything energy and renewable energy. So, um, you know, this is sort of the goal of the talk is to just give the tools and the fundamental knowledge to go out and continue learning and exploring this topic. I'll cover um, everything a little bit. Um, and then if you're interested in any more technical details, um, of course, in the questions and answers, I'm more than happy to do what I can. And then, of course, feel free to reach out to me afterwards to follow up on anything you might be interested in. So with that said, uh, we can begin. So to sort of frame um, the rest of this talk, um, this is all sort of in the context of the global energy challenge. This is sort of the reason why this is all important. Um, and the global energy challenge uh, essentially is just producing enough energy and producing it in the means, the most sustainable means possible, such that everybody is able to have um, enough electricity to meet their demands or enough power and energy to meet their demands. Um, which is very difficult in today's world. We have an ever-increasing population. We have ever-increasing standards of living. And both of those things are good. Um, but in a world where both of those things are true and technology becomes an ever more important and powerful part in our lives, that's going to progressively increase the amount of energy that we need um, to meet that energy demand. So the energy demand in general is always growing. Um, and then second of all, um, doing that without uh, with, with keeping climate disruption and climate change and environmental considerations in mind. Um, so both of those things sort of form the basis of the energy challenge uh, and both are enormous hurdles. So uh, another thing that I kind of want to cover just from the outset that I think is sort of a key consideration is just talking briefly about what is energy. Um, this is a whole rabbit hole. I mean, you could do PhD after PhD just sort of on this topic in one way or another. Uh, so I'm not going to get into any technical detail. I just sort of want to clarify what I mean by energy and, and what we're really talking about. So energy, of course, takes many forms, potential, kinetic, heat, light, gravitational. Uh, there are many forms of energy. And again, you can talk about energy really all day long. But in our context, what we really mean is, I think, best encapsulated in this definition. Um, where it's power derived from the utilization of physical or chemical resources, especially to provide light and heat or to work machines. So it's essentially energy that is useful to live our lives, power our lives, power our technology. Um, and that's, of course, a very broad definition, but I think that's sort of the most useful working definition in this context. Um, and I have this, what may seem strange is a, is a note about boiling water. Um, but I find this to just be a very simple insight uh, and something that just has always struck me as very interesting because there are all of these different types of energy production and they work in, in vastly different ways. Um, but as you'll see, as we go into some of the details of each different uh, method of energy production, that it typically boils down, no pun intended, into boiling water. Uh, and so to give you an example, uh, if we take fossil fuels, a lot of the time what we're doing is we're taking those fossil fuels. Uh, oil, for example, we're combusting the oil, 
and we're using that energy to boil water, generate steam, and using the steam uh, to turn a turbine. And then if we go over to something completely different, like nuclear energy, a totally different technology, a much more complicated technology, um, even though it's different in many respects, at the end of the day, the goal is to produce energy as efficiently as possible to boil water, to produce steam, and turn a turbine and generate electricity. So, uh, you know, half the battle a lot of the time is how efficiently can you boil water? How much energy uh, can you produce as quickly as possible? And then how efficiently can you convert that to steam to turn a turbine? Now, this isn't all of the methods. There are many um, that we'll cover that have nothing to do with this, but I find it interesting that the majority of these just come down to sort of this problem um, because it sort of makes it all so feel so trivial, but it still has enormous engineering challenges. And then, of course, in our context, another distinction in the context of energy is the difference between renewable and non-renewable. And this is, again, sort of the focus of today's talk. So addressing non-renewable versus renewable, um, they're sort of uh, self-explanatory in, the, in the, their names. Non-renewable energy is essentially just energy that's produced from a non-renewable resource. But a key detail is it's not just a non-renewable resource, it's a non-renewable resource that can't be replaced at a pace quick enough to keep up with consumption. Um, so for example, we'll take fossil fuels again. Um, fossil fuels, um, as we'll talk about a little bit more shortly, fossil fuels are produced from organic matter um, being covered in layer after layer of sediment, being exposed to extreme temperatures and pressures over a long period of time, and then depending on sort of the details in terms of what those conditions are, what was the chemical makeup of those organisms, will be converted into one or more type of fossil fuel. And this process takes uh, hundreds of millions of years, it takes an extremely long time and requires very particular conditions. Um, so technically speaking, it is not entirely non-renewable. Fossil fuels can and will continue to be produced after we've exhausted um, all of the major deposits, but um, it takes a long enough time, um, and especially considering how quickly we consume them, that once we've used them all up, they're effectively gone. Um, so that's what we mean by non-renewable. And fossil fuels and nuclear are really the two main non-renewable sources, at least that we'll be talking about today. Then we have renewable energy, which is simply just the opposite. This is energy produced from a, a source uh, that doesn't deplete, that is renewable. And one of the, the obvious examples is something like solar energy. Um, again, technically uh, non-renewable in the sense that the sun will exhaust all of its fuel and, and, and light will no longer shine on the earth after a long enough time. But you know, in that case, we have bigger problems. <laughs> so uh, effectively, the sun um, is a renewable resource in the sense that whether we take advantage of harvesting energy from the sun that hits the earth or not, day after day, it will continue to do so. And us capturing that energy will play no role in whether the next day the sun will shine, there will be more energy to capture. Um, and in the recent decades, there's been this enormous push uh, to a transition to renewable energy from non-renewable. And this is primarily motivated by climate disruption. Um, notably, it's not just climate disruption. There are broader environmental considerations um, as well as economic and uh, equitability considerations. But probably it's fair to say that first and foremost, this is all motivated by uh, climate disruption. So briefly to cover this issue, because again, this sort of lies at the heart of the energy challenge and, and our efforts in renewable energy. Um, again, it is first and foremost primarily motivated by uh, climate disruption, and namely climate change. So as a very brief overview just of climate change in particular, the problem is most of our energy currently and historically has come from fossil fuels. The combustion of fossil fuels produces greenhouse gases, and most importantly, carbon dioxide. These gases accumulate in the atmosphere um, and have the effect of, of gradually heating the, the overall temperature, uh, the average temperatures across the globe. And this has uh, cascading effects, uh, many of which are, are very negative. Uh, rising temperatures lies to lead to uh, rising sea levels by uh, melting the polar ice caps, and rising sea levels have, uh, threaten a lot of coastal um, cities and populations. And um, as I'm sure you all know, most of life, most of the world's societies uh, tend to aggregate along the coast. So it's a serious threat to many, many people across the world, uh, as well as infrastructure and ways of life and so on. Um, and that's just one example. So climate change um, is certainly an issue that, of course, we need to continue working very hard to address. And then it goes beyond climate change as well, because even aside from that, 
fossil fuels, for example, uh, you know, there's many historical, uh, quite infamous oil spills throughout history. That's another environmental consideration that's specific to a non-renewable resource like fossil fuels. So there are these myriad of issues uh, that come from non-renewable sources and particularly fossil fuels that are fundamentally climate-based. And that's sort of the goal. Um, so again, yeah, uh, for the fossil fuels produce greenhouse gases. They warm the client, uh, climate. We also have oil and gas discovery, recovery, and processing that pose numerous uh, environmental risks. Um, so renewable energy typically, uh, and it's important to note typically, not certainly not always, is safer for both people and the environment. And uh, that's sort of everywhere uh, along the chain of consideration. So, uh, you know, this, your, your solar panel will never uh, explode in the way that a nuclear reactor, right? Or a solar panel is never going to uh, have, a, have a very serious and acute negative health side effects on the people who are exposed to it. And then it goes one step further. Um, there's also other considerations like shipping and transport, um, equitability, just in terms of which countries actually have the resource and therefore have control over uh, access to the resource and so on. So um, a lot of renewable energy technologies also offer the potential for a little bit more of a equitable energy market because um, regardless of what country where in the world, what society, what government, and so on, um, one or more renewable sources are typically available. Whereas, again, something like oil and gas is really localized to five to 15 countries or so. So if we take a little bit more of a uh, closer look uh, at each of the, the sort of the key energy um, methods of production, both renewable and non-renewable, again, non-renewable, the most relevant is certainly fossil fuels. Uh, and by fossil fuels, I really mean coal, uh, oil and natural gas. And approximately 80% of the world's uh, energy comes from fossil fuels today. So this is after we've already started making this massive push for renewable energy. We still have 80% of it is coming from fossil fuels. Um, and again, the, the way this, this happens is you have um, prehistoric life, prehistoric life dies, plants and animals, dinosaurs to ferns, really all sorts of ancient life. Um, year after year, it gets covered by more and more sediment. As it does so, it goes deeper underground, closer to the Earth's core, uh, and therefore it gets warmer. So it starts getting exposed to these very, very high temperatures. And as it gets further and further submerged, more and more sediment layers lead to more and more pressure, just as there's more sediment above. Um, and after a very long time, again, depending on the chemical composition of those plant and animal lives, um, you will have one or more type of fossil fuel. Um, again, fossil fuels are responsible for the majority of greenhouse gases, and that's really where the heart of this issue lies. Um, but one thing I definitely want to highlight, um, and I say this as somebody who's very excited and very interested, very passionate about renewable energy and sustainability, um, is that fossil fuels, like it or not, are not going anywhere. <laughs> as I said, currently, they're 80% of the world's energy. Um, that is not going to change anytime soon. Um, the goal is essentially to minimize it as fast and best we can, but we should sort of temper our expectations. It's important to note that uh, today, tomorrow, next week, next year, 10 years, uh, is not going to be the time where fossil fuels reach 0%, uh, or if ever, if they ever reach 0%. So fossil fuels will, rem will remain a dominant part of our lives in an energy context, um, but again, it's about minimizing it um, and substituting it as quickly as possible and then finding uh, the most efficient, clean, environmentally uh, safe ways to continue extracting and using fossil, fossil fuels. Um, and then to take a, a little bit of a look at nuclear energy, um, a lot of the times, uh, I'll start by saying this, a lot of the times people hear non-renewable and they make an association with bad. Non-renewable is bad and renewable is good. And it's, it's not the case. There's a lot of nuance here, and it really depends. So just, the goal is not to, to vilify uh, non-renewable sources or even particularly fossil fuels. Um, each energy source has pros and cons, and they all need to be used in such a way um, that it, it, it effectively makes sense. So nuclear is a great example for this because nuclear although it's a very controversial topic and there's a lot of brilliant people who would very quickly speak out and, and speak negatively about nuclear. Overall, I think it's fair to say that there's a consensus that nuclear is one of the, the best and most exciting um, energy production methods that we use today and that we hope to continue to use today. Um, so non-renewable certainly doesn't mean bad. Um, and then in the context of 
how nuclear energy actually works. Broadly speaking, it gets broken down into two different uh, technologies, nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. Uh, nuclear fission um, is what we use today. I'll put nuclear fusion aside for a moment. Uh, all of the nuclear power plants of the world today are using nuclear fission. And in a nuclear power plant, again, first of all, fundamentally, it's about using nuclear reactions to generate a lot of uh, energy, a lot of heat, uh, which boils water, produces steam, turns a turbine, and generates electricity. So at the end of the line, it's still the same as, as more or less everything else or, or the majority of other methods. But um, the way actually fission works, and of course, there's a, you know, there's endless topics of research in, in nuclear fission and nuclear chemistry and physics. Uh, but in general, in short, um, you take a neutron. So if you consider atoms, then uh, composing atoms are electrons, protons, and neutrons. They're the subatomic particles. Uh, you take neutron and you can shoot neutrons at very, very high speeds uh, at a target, which is simply a larger atom. And that collision will result in the splitting of that atom uh, to produce two new atoms and more neutrons. And what you do is after you get that process going, there's a chain reaction uh, where you start splitting atom after atom after atom. And by carefully controlling this reaction, uh, you can produce enormous amounts of energy while also not letting it uh, have a runaway reaction and effectively have a, a nuclear explosion. Um, so the benefit really is just that it produces enormous amounts of energy. Um, and it's also completely carbon neutral. So it's not greenhouse gas neutral because there is water vapor that's produced and even water vapor is considered a greenhouse gas. But the main concern are the carbon based greenhouse gases like methane uh, and notably carbon dioxide. So nuclear, uh, while it has its own threats, is carbon neutral and is actually environmentally uh, quite good, quite healthy, uh, healthy profile overall. Of course, that it's not perfect. There's many famous disasters that have happened throughout history. There was Chernobyl in Ukraine, uh, Fukushima in Japan, and, and many more that didn't receive quite the amount of coverage. Um, but thankfully, if we consider each of those, those very dangerous cases, most of the time, um, it, was, it, it sort of makes sense. So for example, in Chernobyl, um, the reactor design was totally insufficient. It was a really dangerous reactor design. Nothing like would ever be um, put up today or allowed to run today um, and uh, isn't really a concern for modern nuclear reactors. Um, with Fukushima, the main issue was basically where it was placed. I mean, putting it in a highly seismically active area is, is not a good idea as, as uh, history bore out. Um, but this isn't really to say anything against nuclear in particular. And in the grand scheme of things, even though those are, of course, uh, tragic um, sort of society changing events, um, they pale in comparison to what we might face if we continue uh, combusting fossil fuels at this rate. So overall, I would say nuclear is one of the most exciting, one of the most promising uh, means of energy production, even though it's non-renewable. Um, although the debate rages on in terms of whether or not the, the risk and reward um, is worth doing. Um, but that's all nuclear fission. Nuclear fis fusion is another side of things. This is something you may all have heard about, especially in the last year or two. There's been enormous developments. Nuclear fusion is basically the opposite of nuclear fission. So rather than splitting atoms, you're actually fusing atoms to make new atoms. Uh, and the big picture is really that this produces, nuclear fission is already highly efficient at making a lot of energy nuclear fusion even more so. There is a truly enormous amount of energy that's released from nuclear fusion. And um, the problem now is really just in the technology. Um, a lot of people think we've never actually achieved nuclear fusion. We have um, many, many, many times. The problem is the amount of energy required to get the reaction going um, is actually more equal or more than the amount of energy that we get out. So that's not very useful. If we're putting more energy to make fusion happen in the first place, uh, then we're getting out. Well, then we're actually just losing energy, even though the reaction is generating quite a bit. So the goal is basically to produce as much energy um, as possible. And nuclear fusion is, is sort of the holy grail. It's, it's one of those technologies that's been 5, 10, 15 years away for a very long time. Um, and optimistically, maybe we have 50 to 100 years, according to some some experts on the forefront, um, but we'll see. But that is truly one of the holy grails of science. It would fundamentally change the world and probably make it um, is one of the few ways that at least I feel I can see 
that we can deliver um, an excess of energy to people across the world. So for now, we have to hang in tight, use a combination of these other renewable and non-renewable sources. So uh, for the rest of these uh, energy production methods, I can go ahead and I'll, I'll provide some case studies, some real life examples, just highlighting some of the interesting or incredible engineering, uh, just to give you a bit of a visual or an idea of how this, this is actually looking and operating in practice. So uh, I'll give you the example of the Palo Verde uh, generating station. This is actually in my uh, home state of Arizona in the southwest of the US. Um, and this station is interesting for, for many reasons. Uh, one is it's the largest power station in the United States. So it's not just the largest nuclear power station, it's the largest power station period in the United States, which gives you some sense of just how much energy uh, this facility is producing. Um, again, this is clean and carbon free. These are sort of just intrinsic to nuclear energy. Uh, there are no uh, carbon based greenhouse gas emissions or really any other environmental pollutants. I should say um, there is nuclear waste. So um, there are harmful byproducts, but rather than a lot of other energy production methods, rather than it just being um, uncontrolled, <clears throat> uncontrollably released into the environment, uh, the nuclear waste can be very, very carefully controlled. Um, and it's quite easy to avoid it from to have it uh, contaminate the environment. The problem is the nuclear waste lasts for a very, very long time, and it's not something that you can just transfer over to a landfill. So typically there are specialized facilities, often in the desert, at least here in the US, where there is enormous buildings, warehouse sized buildings, often deep underground uh, with very, very thick walls of concrete, sometimes lead lined walls um, to sort of contain that radiation. Um, but even then, this is expensive, um, requires a lot of land, it requires a lot of labor, it still does pose various environmental risks. So nuclear is far from perfect, um, but all things considered, it is uh, quite good. Um, but in the case of the Palo Verde nuclear power plant, again, this generates more than 32 million megawatt hours annually, which is just enormous. And to put that into, pers into perspective, that's about 4 million homes and businesses. Um, so just a, truly an almost unbelievable amount of people for one facility that is quite large, but in the grand scheme of things for the amount of uh, amount of homes and businesses that it's able to power. Um, it's 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 quite efficient and uh, further interestingly you'll notice this being in Arizona it's in the desert. And the reason I point that out is most nuclear facilities are built around a naturally occurring body of water because um, to. to facilitate the energy production process, they need water for cooling of the nuclear reaction and the generation of steam. Um, and in Arizona, we don't have that luxury of having the water readily available. So in our case, we use reclaimed and recycled water from uh, city muni municipalities, uh, which is which is uh, just highlights how flexible nuclear can actually be because you know previously this may have been considered sort of a disqualifying factor. Um, but not only was it not it actually uh, didn't even prevent it from it becoming the, the largest nuclear generating station. Apologies, I'm having, there we go. So now we'll transition into uh, taking a look at some of the renewable uh, energy methods. So we'll start with the biggest one, hydropower. Again, this is the largest producer of renewable energy. Um, and therefore, I suppose the most relevant um, and hydropower i'm sure everybody is familiar with it's it's fairly straightforward in terms of technology it uses falling or fast running water to produce electricity to power machines. So it converts the gravitational potential energy in the case of falling water or the kinetic energy in the case of fast running water uh, to produce power. Um, and, as I said, fossil fuels produce uh, or compose about 80% uh, of the world's energy production. Um, where renewable makes up the other 20 and of the 20 that uh, is composed of renewable 16% comes from hydropower so hydropower is playing an enormous role already and again will is, is expected to continue to grow. So one of uh, maybe the most famous examples uh, and most interesting examples is the three gorges dam in China at the Yangtze River. Um, and what's interesting here. Uh, many, many interesting things. There's some wonderful documentaries, I think probably even some wonderful books. This is, I, I definitely encourage you taking a, a deeper look if you're at all interested. But this is not just the world's, China's largest 
um, hydropower station or even China's largest uh, power station. It's actually the world's largest power station in terms of installed capacity at 22,500 megawatts. So just a, a truly enormous, it trumps the Palo Verde nuclear power plant, a lot of other nuclear facilities, of course. Um, it produces truly unbelievable amounts of energy and it's hydropower. So for me, it's interesting because it sort of highlights a lot of people have the idea that renewable energy produces a little bit. It doesn't have the, the capacity to compete with something like nuclear or fossil fuels, but it does. And the Three Gorges Dam is a testament to that. And the engineering, the feat of engineering that is this dam is, is remarkable. It's absolutely massive. It took many, many years and billions of dollars to make. Um, so it is truly in, in, in modern marble. Uh, and it's producing electricity to millions, uh, likely tens of millions uh, of homes and businesses in China. So um, I very much encourage you taking a look to, to whatever extent you're interested. Uh, then moving on to geothermal energy. Geothermal energy is, is among my favorites, I would say. It's probably honestly among the less relevant just because so many fewer countries have access uh, to geothermal or, or have geothermal activity present uh, within their borders. So you really have to be fortunate with whether or not it's there. Um, but it's very interesting. Uh, geothermal energy, as the name suggests, this is heat that's generated from within the earth that we can harvest either directly or indirectly uh, for energy production. Um, and that heat that is at the, the center of the earth, uh, the earth has a, it's about a 1500 kilometer uh, diameter iron core, molten iron. Um, that's roughly the temperature of the sun. Uh, and this is fueled by the radioactive decay of, of elements within the core of the earth that keeps this heat going. Um, and that heat uh, will radiate out from the center and gradually dissipate as it reaches the surface. Um, and then towards the surface, we can actually drill down um, and make use of this energy. Um, and we'll talk about this more in a moment, but again, it can be used directly or indirectly and some of the ways uh, that people across the world have begun using it uh, directly uh, are, are super interesting. So uh, in this case, we're not going to talk about a specific facility. We can talk about actually an entire country um, and probably the headquarters, the most, the most famous nation to uh, use a lot of geothermal energy is Iceland. Um, so to give you an idea, 85% of homes in Iceland are heated with geothermal energy. Um, which is incredible because Iceland, you know, it's quite cold for a good portion of the year. So a huge portion of their, their total energy consumption does go to heating their homes. So the fact that 85% of the homes are heated with geothermal uh, says quite a lot. Um, in total, and in total, Iceland has about 800 megawatts of power produced by geothermal energy. Um, and as I said, they use it both directly and indirectly. And I think some of the, the direct uses are super interesting because as you can see in the photo on the right, um, what we're looking at here is this network of, of tubes um, that, and these are placed below parks or parking structures, roads, sidewalks, all sorts of places. And what they do is they pump hot water, hot geothermal water uh, directly from the earth. Um, and they flow it through these tubes in places where they want the snow to melt. So rather than spending the time and the money and the resources um, to go and, and clear roads, make sure that they're safe and accessible and uh, the same is true again for for parking structures parks uh, a lot of public spaces they just pump this hot water run it underneath the road stays nice and nice and dry um, and then that water is actually just put back into the earth it hasn't been contaminated it simply runs through these tubes uh, where the earth uh, can reheat it and it can be pumped out again uh, for the same use um, and then it can also be used as a more uh, typical uh, indirect use for energy production same sort of thing, using the heat and the energy to turn a turbine is ultimately what it comes down to. Um, but Iceland is, a, is an interesting case because they sort of represent what the future could look like in many respects, because they make great use of geothermal energy. Uh, the same is true of hydropower, even solar a little bit. Um, they're sort of, they, they really are front runners uh, in terms of renewable energy. They're, they're very fortunate with having all of that access. That's, that's very unique, most countries. Uh, regardless of who you are, doesn't really have the luxury of having all of these geothermal or all of these renewable sources at their fingertips, but um, they do sort of highlight what could be. 
Um, so the next is solar energy. This is the one I would, I would assume that most people are familiar with. Um, it produces about 3.6% of the world's energy. So compared to something like hydropower or of course fossil fuels, it's quite little. Um, but this I believe has the fastest growth rate. So this number you can expect to grow rapidly, uh, very quickly over the next even five to 10 years. It could occupy as much as five to 10%, perhaps even more, depending on certain technological breakthroughs. Um, but solar is super interesting because there are actually many different types. When people hear solar, they mostly think of uh, solar panels, like what you see in the image, but this is actually one, just one type of solar. Uh, those are photovoltaic cells, and that's one type of technology. There's also solar thermal, which I'll talk about more in a moment, um, and then other models of generating all sorts of solar-based devices. Um, so this is the third largest renewable energy source, um, and again, produces about 3, 3.5% of the world's energy. Um, and for our case study here, um, this is a facility in California, so just on the border between California and Nevada, so not far from Los Angeles and Las Vegas to give you an idea of, of where it is. Um, and I don't know how many of you are interested in, in Lord of the Rings or something similar, but these this screams uh, Mordor to me. This screams, it, it looks science fiction. Um, and it really is because what we're talking about is these enormous towers that I'll explain more about in a moment um, that are surrounded by these concentric rings of, of mirrors. They're called heliostats. And they're essentially two mirrors, uh, hyperbolic mirrors, all of which track the sun and focus the light onto the target, which is this, this bright glowing um, capsule at the top of this tower. Um, and all of the energy of the light that's being focused onto that target uh, essentially heats that target up. Inside that container is actually uh, sodium chloride, so just salt. And the reason that they put salt in there, as strange as that might sound, um, is because what you salt has a very, very high melting temperature um, and it dissipates heat very slowly. So you can use that energy to melt the salt. You have liquid salt in that container, and then it's essentially a battery. It's able to retain that energy without losing it to the environment very quickly. And then as needed, that energy can sort of, guess what? It can be used to boil water, to produce steam, to turn a turbine and generate electricity. Um, but there are these massive structures. Um, you know, in this particular facility, it's 392 megawatts, but maybe the more interesting number is almost 175,000 heliostats. So an enormous number of these these little devices are required for this type of thing. And it's it's unsurprisingly the world's largest solar thermal station. The downsides here, uh, there are many. First of all, you can see it requires um, the right sort of landscape. You know, you don't want a lot of cloud coverage. You need uh, essentially a, a sunny desert environment, a warm, sunny place. Um, it also requires an enormous amount of land to, to make it viable. And that's also quite difficult. Of course, this you couldn't put this in, in the city or really anywhere near a city needs to be sort of out in, in sort of a rural remote location and then it needs to also just have the right uh, sort of basic conditions. Uh, they're also very expensive. They take quite a while to sort of pay themselves off. So it's sort of considered a, a price you pay to accelerate the decarbonization of fossil fuels, but they're incredible. Another feat of engineering, super interesting. Um, there are more and more appearing across the world, but again, this is a uh, this is probably a little bit more specific to the few places that are just by happenstance have, have the resources available. Then uh, moving into wind energy. Uh, wind is probably maybe after solar, I would assume it's probably the second most familiar to, to everybody. Um, so wind uh, energy is just essentially using wind turbines to convert kinetic energy of the wind uh, to produce electricity. So we're skipping the steam part this time and we're going directly to uh, turning the turbine directly. Um, and interestingly, um, this is sort of the, the heart of wind energy and, and of wind in general, and I think it's a, a bit of a fun fact, I suppose, that uh, many people aren't aware of, is that wind is actually just a byproduct of the sun. So the sun ra uh, radiates light onto Earth and heats up the Earth, but it does so unevenly because the Earth is spinning and it's on an axis, so different places are getting different exposures for different amounts of time. Um, and then the earth, the surface of the earth is uneven, there are valleys and mountains, and therefore some are closer to the source and farther away. So the atmosphere, the earth itself are heated unevenly, um, and this uneven heating leads to uh, convection currents that ultimately produce the wind. 
And um, after hydropower, it's the second largest producer of renewable energy. So again, we have hydropower as the largest renewable, then wind, and then solar. Sorry, okay, there we go. So uh, taking a look uh, at a, a short case study for wind, um, this is the Whitley Wind Farm. This is in about central western Scotland. Um, the UK is definitely one of the, the front runners in terms of wind energy. Um, and in the UK, it produces about a quarter, roughly a quarter to a third um, of the energy in the UK. So again, quite a bit. And um, as a reminder, this is still sort of early days. So that sort of number I consider to be encouraging and sort of hopeful because at this stage, um, if we're able to do something like produce a quarter from wind alone, that is quite a good sign in the future. But again, it's similar to all of the other renewable or non-renewable sources. It's just a function of, of the resources that are available to any given country. So the goal is to sort of everybody uh, do their part, whether it's uh, leveraging solar, leveraging wind. Um, there's a lot of marine based, uh, current based renewable energy sources as well. There's many, many different types of renewable energy sources that are still being developed that might take even larger percentages that are on this list today. Um, but re returning to the wind, uh, again, this is called the Whiteley Wind Farm. It's the largest onshore wind farm in the UK. The UK also has quite a number of um, offshore wind farms where you essentially have the same thing, hundreds of these wind turbines that are just sitting just off the coast in the ocean. Um, in this case, this has a 540 megawatt capacity, so quite large. And if I remember correctly, I believe it's something like 230, 240 individual wind turbines on this farm alone. Uh, but again, there are downsides. There are always downsides. There are no free rides, uh, as many people like to say. Um, one is quite simple. A lot of people just really hate the wind turbines. They find them ugly. They find them uh, loud. Uh, a lot of people have raised concerns with uh, their threat to a lot of wildlife, of course, birds who are flying into these turbines. So it potentially poses a lot of risk to different wildlife. Um, and there just seems to be a community of people who, who very much so dislike <laughs> having these around them. Um, so in short, um, these are kind of the three big takeaways that I, I really want you all to leave with. Um, the first is that renewable energy has already taken up a large portion of the total energy production. So we're still at 20%. On the one hand, that's small, but on the other hand, that's quite large, especially um, for how quickly this has been progressing and how quickly it's expected to continue to grow. So the future definitely looks bright in, in terms of renewable energy. Um, the second thing is that non-renewable resources will continue to play a dominant role in meeting energy demands. demands. So no time soon will we get away from those, um, including fossil fuels. So um, it's important to sort of keep that in mind, temper your expectations, and also uh, ask yourself if you may want to play a role in continuing to make uh, the part of fossil fuel consumption that we have um, as sustainable as possible. Uh, and then lastly, again, meeting energy demands while curtailing climate disruption uh, remains arguably, if you're asking me and, and certainly many others, uh, one of the most pressing issues uh, that faces humanity and a key part of addressing this challenge will be renewable energy. Uh, so thank you. Um, I put this up last time. This is my email. You're all very welcome to reach out to me with any questions, anything I might be able to help with, really anything. Um, I got a few emails after my last talk. I believe I responded to everybody promptly. Um, in case I did miss anyone, my apologies. It's, you know, I, I'm forgetful as, as uh, anyone else, but please feel free to send me a follow-up email if I happen to not get back to you. And if you haven't reached out to me yet and would like to, there's my email. Um, you're very welcome. And then uh, for those of you who are interested, I also run a podcast on many uh, scientific, historical, philosophical topics. So if this type of thing is interesting to you. Uh, there might be something to benefit from there as well. But again, thank you all so much. Uh, I appreciate it. I hope this was useful and interesting and I'll take as many questions as I can. If you have any question, you can use the hand reaction to raise the question or leave a comment in the chat. Um, we seem to have one question from Dominique. Let's see what she has to say. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. 
Thank you for the opportunity to listen. Uh, my question comes from a bit of a disheartening place this morning. I'm not proud to have to express my question or express my comment in any manner. However, I feel compelled to do so, and here's why. Mm -hmm. I found it difficult to listen to your presentation and to follow because of your premise. Your premise, the premise of your presentation was that you started off by, by me you mentioned fossil fuels. And when you spoke about fossil fuels, you shared that it takes, it is believed by, I, I would like you to, 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 to share with me, even though I do have an idea, it is believed that these fossil fuels have taken or will continue to take or will take in the future millions of years to boil. That concerns me and here's why. That's tied to not only a salvation issue, that's tied to an erroneous issue, that's truth mixed with error. It made it completely difficult for me to listen to, take in and follow your presentation as an open-minded Christian. And here's why to go further. The oldest tree in the world, which is named Methuselah, is a little older than 4,000 years. To say that something takes millions of years, it is connected to evolution. If it is connected to evolution, it says that we evolved from monkeys. It says that the world got here from the Big Bang Theory, which is completely untrue. Because biblically speaking, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit created the world. And that is stated in Genesis. And this information can be found in any Bible. So when you talk about millions or billions of years, it is impossible for any part of the earth, even if we talk about the deepest, the widest, the longest, the furthest part of earth, it can never be any older than 6,000, 7,000 years. So could you help me to understand if Revelation tells me in Revelation chapter 20, verse 5 to 11, what you are sharing with all of these participants, including myself, if I were to believe that something was here for millions of years, that tells me that I'm going to participate in the second coming of Christ. And in the second coming of Christ, I couldn't be a part of the first coming of Christ because that means I didn't believe that he created the world to begin with. So that is why I said to you, it's disheartening for me to even share this information because I know the truth and I couldn't absorb what you're taking in. And I am a person who has spoken in and have been called to speak this, what is known as the three angels messages to people who attend church on Sunday, who know, who, who, who are trying to come to the belief or the understanding that the Sabbath day, which is a Saturday, which stand Saturday, that Sabado in Spanish, the word Saturday alone means um, every language and every single language under the sun, which God distorted at the Tower of Babel, at the Tower of Babel, which can be found in Exodus. Every single language says Saturday, Sabado stands for Sabbath in every language. So that's another truth. So your information for me, sir, is disheartening because I would perish if I believed your premise. So how could I take in the information if, if everything we do under the sun, if, it on, if, only, if all we do, if it's not done for Christ, it will not last how can I absorb what you're saying? And you sound like you enjoy what it is you're sharing. You sound like you love what you're doing. And I don't believe that someone who God took the time to create like you, I don't even believe you want to believe in something that is not true. I don't see that in you. I don't hear that from you. So I trust that what I'm sharing with you as open-minded as I have to be in order to attend any class at AIU, I trust that the Holy Spirit impresses your heart and that you take a look at him, whomever he may be, because he is a person who is physically living and physically existing, because I know what it is to say, who is God? How did I get here? Every single human being goes through that. Why am I here? Where did I come from? And evolution says you're nothing. 
millions of years says, no, there is no God who created you. Millions of years says, we just here and when we, whatever we do is fine, whether it's good, whether it's bad. And when we die, there's nowhere to go anyway, because we, we evolved here, which is absolutely um, the complete opposite of God's plan. And you don't sound like that type of human being to me. You sound like you really believe in renewable energy. You sound like you really trust in the information providers who gave you that information. And even when, if I mention a name, Ken, capital K-E-N, Ham, capital H-A-M. Ken Ham um, had a debate with Bill Nye, the science guy. I know what it is to watch Bill Nye, the science guy growing up. Ken Ham basically um, when he debated with, with Bill Nye, the science guy, the only thing that Bill Nye could do was elude Ken Ham's questions. So if Bill Nye himself, who believes in millions and billions of years, could not, and I encourage you to look it up because you sound like, you sound honest. You sound believable. You sound like you believe, when I say believable, you sound like you believe in what you are studying. And I don't think you want you any further in believing something to press isn't true. But Bill Nye himself couldn't find any substance in what he believed in when Ken, Ken Ham spoke to him. And he had to agree to speak to Ken Ham. And he had to agree to be televised when speaking to Ken Ham. And he had to agree to have all of the followers who he has ever taught, like myself, who subjected myself to television, to know that, hey, I really, I, I, I really have no foundation here, but I'm choosing to believe this because I can't. And you don't sound like that type of person to me. And I really don't wish to do this to you today. But I encourage you because the spirit in me, my sp spiritually, I can't, I can't walk away from this presentation and, not, and, and say nothing. And I'm sure I'm, even if I am the only person here I think you might be cutting out a little bit. I, I don't, I heard everything you said, but just right now, the last 10 seconds or so, are you still there? Yes, I'm, I'm still here. What I, what I, what I, thank you for expressing that. I said, if, if I, I pray that you are encouraged to, to, to look up Ken Ham. I pray that you're encouraged to look up the tree Methuselah. I am, I, I pray that you're encouraged to, to research um, the Earth's existence of less than six thousand years and challenge what you've been learned, what you've been taught by the information providers, where the world existed millions and billions of years. That that's all that I can truly leave with you. And I I am grateful to have to be a to be a blessing. I'm grateful to be a witness, and I'm grateful to have asked this question. So thank you. So. Needless to say, uh, there's a lot, a lot, a lot that could be said there. Um, in general, let me just say, I appreciate you just sharing everything you shared. Uh, I'll be very frank with you. Like if we were to sort of get into it, I, I'm sure we, we would have a lot of disagreements. Um, but the most important thing for me, I mean, the nature of, of university and of academic discourse and discussion is to feel comfortable and to be able to uh, share your mind exactly as you see it. And for me, the only thing that really matters is that you did that. Um, okay. and I can respond and I, I take everything you're saying in good faith. And I take everything you're saying seriously in the sense that I, I'm not uh, dismissive of, of any of that. Um, I will say, uh, again, it's, it's, it's difficult without getting too into it. I, I, I am familiar with the discussion that you're referring to. And this whole topic uh, is something I've spent a lot of time learning and researching into. And, uh, you know, I don't find, I don't find uh, much, much of what I'm referring to comes less from a place of the information that I've been taught and that I'm sort of simply re-communicating. Um, that's sort of one of the, the beautiful things about uh, doing a degree in something like chemistry and, and doing that type of research is you really get to see for yourself exactly how this works. I know a lot of a lot of the claims that you're getting at. Um, I certainly think that there's there's more to learn, and, and maybe that's part of the problem here. 
Um, but there are so many aspects to something like evolution and to uh, geology, uh, radiocarbon dating, all of these different considerations that um, I do, as you suggest, I believe them honestly and I believe them earnestly. And uh, for what it's worth, these sort of opinions definitely do reflect uh, the scientific consensus, the, the, the overwhelming majority will agree. That isn't to say you have to agree or anything like that. Um, I, I just sort of view my job here today to be sort of a representative of the scientific community on these topics. Um, I always, always, always think it's good, whether we're talking from any sort of perspective, spiritual or otherwise, regardless of the faith or largest of the political stance and, and so on and so forth. Um, the more inquiry, the better. Um, but respectfully, of course, I, I would have to disagree with uh, much of what you said. But I, I, for what it's worth, I, I do mean very sincerely. I think it's very important to be able to be comfortable. And especially, it's clear the passion is in your voice. Um, and it's, it makes me feel good, at least, that uh, you felt comfortable to be able to say all of that. And uh, again, my email is there. I would be more than happy to continue this conversation at length in whatever capacity. Um, all of these topics are interesting and they do have a way of sort of intermingling. So uh, thank you again. I, I still have to sort of hold strong <laughs> to some extent and disagree with, with the, the premise of, of what you're getting at because I do um, to say believe in evolution is, is a bit difficult, but uh, I I do think there's good reason to, to think that there, the, the Earth is many millions of years old, or 4.7 billion years old, and the Big Bang is is an event we can reliably uh, treat as having happened. Um, and there, there's a there's a very strong scientific basis for it. But in the same way that I might be ignorant to a lot of the theology that you're referring to, um, there might be some aspects to the, the physics and the chemistry and the astronomy and so on that you might not be aware of, that you might find convincing or might not. So um, I'll make you a promise in that I will revisit that conversation. I will revisit all of the things you're referring to. Um, if you promise to take a look online or reach out to me uh, and take a look a little bit more into, uh, I can point you in the direction of some resources and let me know your thoughts. But um, the discussion is everything, so thank you. Thank you, Dominique. Um, we have another question from Ike Edwin. Let's see what she, he has to say. Yes, good afternoon from Nigeria. Ike Edwin is my name. I hope you are hearing me. Yes, I can hear you well. Let me just finish a long Sorry, now, now you're you're a bit difficult to hear. I have I haven't heard uh, your question so far. Okay, you can you can write the question as well or quit the camera so you have better connection. Uh, it's not much better. It, the, the connection seems to be breaking up. Yes. You can write a question in the chat and we will gladly read it out. So for the meantime, let's see what Karen has to say. I think you're uh, muted, Karen, yeah. Okay, yeah, I have a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Great. So we've talked about non-renewable energy and in the past two years, Nord Stream 2 uh, by Russia has been the biggest project globally. But why isn't it popular? Why, is, why aren't people buying Gazprom? So last month, last two months ago, Gazprom issued um, a statement saying that they were offering 50% discount. Uh, for China market, and then they went into India market. So basically, 
Number one, is this due to Russia's sanctions or is it a fuel quality? Is it too much carbon emission or is fossil fuel just not popular? What are the three choices? What do you think? I think that completely comes down to the geopolitical situation. I think it's the sanctions on Russia. It's the entire conflict is leading to that because in terms of quality and all of that, um, I mean, again, as we talked about, fossil fuels have their problems that the, the, their fossil fuels are really as good as any. The quality is fine and it was supplying the majority of Europe for a long time and also a lot of other places across the world. It does just purely come down to, to those sanctions. And then, uh, you know, I mean, and this is to get into a bit of a hot topic, but there was uh, the destruction of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. So even if uh, the sanctions weren't relevant, now uh, some of the infrastructure is just destroyed. Who did that destruction? I'm not sure. <laughs> there's a there's a there's a lot of debate over that. But I, I can say that the main reason is just geopolitical considerations and, and sanctions due to the conflict. We have another question in the chat. It says from Sydney. Sydney Ben, what is the difference between green energy and renewable renewable energy? Um there they're somewhat the same a lot of people i think use them interchangeably um, it gets very semantic very quickly green energy renewable energy again specifically is saying okay the source that we're using is like a fuel um, to produce the energy um, isn't going to deplete that's specifically what renewable energy is getting at but renewable energy is also green energy because green energy typically just means energy that is uh, at least mostly safe for the environment and for us. So renewable energy is also green energy, um, but green energy is not necessarily renewable energy because something like nuclear energy could be considered green because it doesn't produce greenhouse gases or uh, doesn't have a lot of the problems of a lot of other energy sources, um, but it is not renewable. So hopefully that answers that question. If you have any other question, you can use the heavy action or leave a, leave a comment in the chat. Let's see if he, he uh, can share his thoughts. Mm -hmm. Do you have any question in your chat, Tyler? Yeah, I'm just going into it now. Sorry. Let's see. I see somebody say they would like the presentation shared uh, surely I think that will be posted. Um, okay, I, I have the question from Ag. please can the presenter throw a little light on the difference between various sources in terms of cost? Um, a lot of that information, quite honestly, I, I don't have at the top of my head, but I can give you um, sort of a, a big picture. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great question because it's a very complicated question because um, you have each of the, the methods that we discussed, but then you can continuously subdivide them. So take Solar, for example, we talked about the photovoltaic cells as well as the sol solar thermal energy. Um, so it's quite difficult to even just using that as an example. Solar thermal, I mean, those facilities are billions and billions of dollars. Um, I, to quantify it exactly off the top of my head, uh, I'm not quite so sure, but I can confidently say billions of dollars. Um, and then it's probably decades before it produces enough uh, energy before uh, it pays for itself. Um, but at the same time, you have solar cells, which can be made all sorts of different ways, um, some more efficient, some less efficient, and then it's sort of a cost benefit analysis in terms of, do we want to pay extra to have all of the arrays that are highly efficient to get as much use out of it as possible, or are we okay with taking five to 10% off the efficiency to be able to produce this very cheaply and to be able to put it everywhere. Um, so it's hard to say. Um, I will say though, also in general that renewable energy to me is also exciting because I, I do believe it's it's largely a more equitable category of energy production because like I said, wherever you are in the world, whatever country, um, everybody has something, whether it's certain plants that can be converted into ethanol for fuel instead of fossil fuels, 
again, whether it's any of the, the renewable sources we made today, and they don't necessarily need to be made at any scale. You can have a, a, a very small hydropower plant. Um, I had the chance of visiting a hydropower plant in Iceland that was in somebody's backyard and it produced all of their electricity through a small river that ran behind them. So I think that sort of highlights the point. It can be extremely cost effective. It can be uh, so small that it fits uh, in, in, in your own property or it could be enormous that it powers an entire an entire region. So the cost varies enormously on a case by case basis, uh, ranging from highly affordable to uh, prohibitively expensive. So I, I know that's not the best answer. Um, I wish I had some of those figures um, to, to give you, but in general, it really sweeps the whole spectrum. Well, I think that's the last question. Thank you very much, Tyler. Of course. Thank you everyone for their time here. And let's see you today again at the same hour. Uh, for another live class. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.